he wrote his first edition. So he decided to write this book, Fine Points of Furniture, Early American, and that's what established Good, Better, Best. And it became this really amazing, because it's gone through so many printings, it's, it, I mean, it's way probably over 25 or 30 printings now. And you can relate it to life, because whether you're buying a car, whether you're buying your shirt, or women are buying a pair of shoes. You know, there's always the good, there's the better, and the best. When you read the introduction by Albert, <coughs> it starts with the, uh, this great little quote that I put on our agenda, you're welcome to some, and uh, it says, there's been so much hocus pocus written about the world of antiques over the years. And that was kind of an Albert thing to say. You know, he was going right to the matter. He wanted truth, he wanted reality, he didn't want, you know, Florid, florid <coughs> language, florid language. He wanted stuff, you know, the facts, and he wanted to really convey the sense of beauty. And what really Albert really touched on in his great goal was that he really defined this uh, term of comparative looking. And it's just that visual, simple approach of how to compare one object to the other. And when you really start walking down that road, you really get into some exciting experiences as you're starting to discover the subtle differences of form and carving and proportion, and condition and history and all these great little details and minute aspects of Americana. Uh, but it really started with Albert's, you know, straightforwardness and his ability to see, you know, see an object for what it, what it was. So this is a portrait of a, a guy from Middletown. And it says his name right here, Augustus Cook, Esquire, Middletown of Connecticut. So he was an attorney in Middletown, probably just about, uh, well, you turn it around, and lo and behold, painted by William Gurley Brown, and that's October 11th, 1842. So the really wonderful thing is we know who the portrait is of, who painted it, and it's all original. So that is good. Okay, it's a nice, good portrait done by a very proficient artist, not a great artist. Yeah, and this is Captain Stephen Clay of Middletown, Connecticut, and it's the only known portrait of a sea captain from Middletown. It makes it quite rare. And he's painted by an artist, we can tell from the style. Actually, he was also signed, although the back has been relined. Uh, this portrait is very well documented and was uh, painted by the artist William Jennis. And uh, it's documented in a very important reference book called The Great River. And that was a show at the Wadsworth Athenaeum uh, back in the 80s. In good condition, you know, great provenance, great history, the importance of the sitter, the importance of the artist, and frankly, the quality of the artist. Uh, Janice kind of captured the realism of Captain Clay's face a little better than William Gurley Brown captured uh, Mr. Cook here. Mr. Cook's a little bit flatter. You don't quite have the roundness and the subtleties of volume and shading that you get with the Janice portrait. 
So the next one is this one. This is best. This was done by a, a painter in New London. His name was Isaac Sheffield. And he pretty much only did portraits of sea captains in New London. That's what he's known for. There's not that many portraits known by him. They are scarcer than hell and very desirable because in the window behind him is a whole whaling scene, what is called cutting in. And they would catch whales and then pull them up next to the bow of the ship. At the time, that's what gave you light in your home. That's what gave you oil to oil your clocks. And so Isaac Sheffield is known for painting these portraits. There's probably less than 15 known by him. And that is actually painted on a wood panel. And so that was done probably about 1840, the same, almost the same age as 1842 of uh, Mr. Brown, Gurley Brown portrait of the lawyer from Middletown. The value difference is almost 25, 25 times because of the whaling scene, which is so romantic and I sort of uh, idolized uh, in our culture. So that is the best because it has survived in remarkable condition and it's totally untouched and there's no doubt we know who painted it. The only thing is we're not exactly sure who the subject is, but we're pretty certain it's the Smith family. And so that is best. And then we're going to show you masterpiece. In the folk world, the folk art world, uh, this particular artist is king right now. This was done by a fellow in Hampton, Connecticut, but, uh, which is up near, just past Willimannock, Connecticut. And that was done by his name was John Brewster, Jr. John Brewster, Jr. was a deaf mute. And he was taught how to paint portraiture by a gentleman who did portraits in Hartford, uh, Reverend uh, Joseph Stewart. So he teaches John Brewster, Jr. how to do portraiture. Only there's something about John Brewster portraits that is so special that nobody seems to quite capture, except maybe him. Maybe because he was a deaf mute. There's lot. There's books written. There's a book written about him recently that he he had he captured the personality of the sitter so well that it's like he knew them and through his paintbrush. He could make you feel, you could look in their eyes. It's almost ethereal. It's amazing. And that's why John Brewster portraits are so highly sought after today. This one happens to be the earliest signed and dated one. She is a classic example of a New England lady with her bonnet and her beautiful turquoise dress string of gold beads uh, from Hampton, Connecticut, farming town. Probably uh, he might have charged $10 for this portrait. But it has stood the test of time. In fact, it gets better. John Brewster was discovered as a folk artist probably in the early 50s. And I would guess that maybe there are maybe 150 portraits known by him. It's a very highly prized portrait. And we just thought it would be good to show you this today, a masterpiece of American folk art. It doesn't come any better. So this is a nice one. It was probably made around 1820. It has a, a really cool top, but the legs are a little provincial. And why do we have this in our inventory? Because it has wonderful wood on the top. It's very graceful. It's sort of charming in its own way. It has a drawer. It accomplishes what they wanted. It has a beautiful old color. And 
not everybody can afford the great or the masterpiece. So this is a really nice example. And go ahead, Kev. You can talk about the next two. Great. The, uh, the stand in the center here has, of course, this real obvious you know, bright headlight on the front is a Battersea enamel brass. And that's the original to the, to the table. Uh, in very good condition, has a bird's eye maple drawer front, uh, figured maple top, uh, mahogany cross banding, figured maple legs, uh, just really nice choice of wood. Probably made in the Boston or North Shore area of Massachusetts. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the workshop of John and Thomas Seymour of Boston. And they also used uh, Battersea enamel hardware on a few of their most important secretaries. Um, this we haven't attributed to the Seymour shop, but it's certainly made by a cabinet maker working on the same level of, of their craftsmanship. Uh, and then again, that comparative looking. If you look at the subtleties of the swell, the tapering of those legs compared to this, you know, straight you know, interesting leg with an interesting turned foot, but what, more, how much more visually exciting is this wonderful gentle swell to the leg going down, you know, swelling out and then going down to taper to that nice uh, ankle ring and then those kind of, again, swelled and tapered feet. Uh, just a, a nice subtleties, but again, really uh, influenced by classical proportions and classical design. So pipe boxes were very popular and they came in a lot of different forms. And so we had the good, better, best, and masterpiece. This is probably the good. You see how tall and slender it is? There we get back to what I said about the models on the runway. You know, if it was if you saw this one. Without those simulated drawers or without all this, it would be sort of squatty. And, but that one is very elegant, really wonderful design. And if you look at this, there's a bell on top. <coughs> it's a, sort of an interesting little design. Yep. There's again the form, which we stressed early on, which to us is the most important. The form of being really tall and elegant, the design at the top, the scrolling on the sides, and it's made out of mahogany. So that was an expensive little box when it was made. It's not, a, you know, uh, probably a little better than this one, but this one is local, it's cherry. This one is probably the best, because look at the beautiful scrolling on the sides. It just had, it has an older color. It's, it's very similar to the other one, but look at, they use these little brass finials, and when they were shiny, it would be like little headlights up there. Just a little bit ele more elegant. But then for the granddaddy, and what, this is where we're going to end our talk, because this is one of the greatest icons of American furniture ever found. Um, that is... Um, uh, probably made in uh, Pomfret, Connecticut, by a, name, a fellow by the name of David Goodale, who was a really amazingly good cabinet maker, looking, working up in this little town of Pomfret, Connecticut. That was so, he, there again, he, he <coughs> just had it. We have seen bureaus made by him, we've seen tables made by him, clock cases. He just had it. He just had that little extra about him that just went over the top. The day this guy <coughs> got up, David Goodale probably really decided to do something incredibly special that day. Maybe somebody specially ordered it, maybe he was making it for himself, but uh, he just didn't know what else to do. He's got, he's got sunbursts, hearts, hearts uh, pinwheels, I mean, he, it's, it's really an amazing piece of creativity, but it's all balanced. It's not over the top. It's not, you know, overcooked. It's not overdone. It's just showing what he could really do uh, on that day. And so it made that much difference. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you.